There are people all across this globe who now will have the opportunity to know you like I do because, of course, you are very forthcoming in telling stories about life, stories that are relatable, and that means something. How wonderful it is, and I just look forward to seeing how how this platform, this new platform, will just rise and grow and really be a, a vessel through which you can be a blessing to folk all over this world. And Lord knows we need it. Today I want to talk about lessons from the parable, Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. And uh, this is a story that uh, many of us grow up with in the church uh, about a man who is uh, picked on by robbers. They beat him, they strip him, uh, they leave him half dead. Uh, and But then a Samaritan comes by to pick the man up on the road. And the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along very well together. So today we're going to be talking about this. And I have a special guest, a young minister, uh, just a few years out of divinity school. And I'm interested to hear his perspective on the Good Samaritan. Stick around and we'll be right back. You know why I really love uh, Nick Hood as a minister? I watched his father uh, do it, and he took over for the church. And uh, he was one of us, but he really turned out to be a great minister. I know it's hard, and that's something that I know that all ministers may not be doing what they're doing because uh, for the right reasons. But I know it's hard. I know he's a beautiful man. And we've been knowing each other for over 50 years. Uh, I believe in him. He's inspired me in so many ways to do what I'm doing and try to be the best at it. Make sure you watch Nick Hood's Ministries. You'll never be the same. Today I want to talk about the Good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, there's the most fascinating story where Jesus has already sent out 70 people, 70 additional disciples. You know, we're familiar with the 12 disciples. You know, we talk about Peter, James, John, and Andrew, uh, Bartholomew, and, and so forth, uh, Thaddeus. But there are 70 others, as a matter of fact, as we go through the New Testament, we'll see that there are many, many more who came into the faith. But this first 70 uh, are commissioned by Jesus to go out into various towns uh, and he gives them all power. Uh, and so they return to him. And as they return to him, uh, they say, Lord, you know, uh, we had a great time. You know, we were received well uh, in all of these villages and even the demons uh, bowed down to us. We were able to cast out demons. And so right after that, the text tells us in the Luke version, in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke versions, it tells us about the parable of the Good Samaritan. In the Luke version, a lawyer stands up. In the, I believe if I'm right, Mark and Matthew he is uh, one of the scribes. Mm -hmm. But in the Luke version, this lawyer stands up and he says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what do the scriptures tell us? And the man replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Um, and, and then Jesus says, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then the man looks at Jesus and he says, he's being smart alecky. In the Luke version, it says, he says this question to justify himself. And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replies, there was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's telling a parable. And remember what a parable is. A parable is a story, but it's not necessarily 
something that has, um, you know, actual events. He said, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, I don't know if anybody looking at this has ever gone from Jerusalem to Jericho, but I have. And it is a winding road. It's not far from Jerusalem. It's below Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is here. Jericho is down here. The man uh, is traveling down this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. In today's world, Jericho is actually uh, led by a Palestinian uh, government, form of government. And, uh, you know, we had to go through an Israeli checkpoint. I went there in 2018 uh, to get into Jericho. But one of the things that amazed me about Jericho that I never read in the Bible, I kept wondering why is Jesus always in Jericho? But Jericho sits over freshwater springs. And in today's world, as in the ancient world, anybody who controlled water had power. And so Jericho is important. It had freshwater springs from emanating from under the earth. It also, because of those freshwater springs, is a place that is uh, just wonderful for vegetation. And so you have all kinds of uh, plants, you have all kinds of fruits and vegetables that grow there. And uh, the man is on his way to Jericho. On the way to Jericho, he is besought by robbers. They, they beat him, they strip him of his clothes, they leave him half dead, they rob him, they take his money. A Levite comes down the road, who's of the priestly class. He does not stop for the man. Matter of fact, he crosses the road to the other side. A priest follows him, who also crosses the road to the other side. They don't want anything to do with this half-naked, half-dead, beaten man. Finally, a Samaritan comes down the road. The Samaritan crosses the road to be with the injured man. He binds his wounds. Uh, he not only binds them, the text tells us that he took wine and he took oil. He mixed them together. Uh, maybe those with knowledge about ancient uh, medicine would know what was really going on there. But it says he bound his wounds. Then he put the man on his beast. And then he took him into Jericho. They found an inn. And there at the end in Jericho, uh, the man, this stranger, this Samaritan, goes into his wallet and he comes out with two denarii, which from what I understand is the equivalent of two days, two days worth of wages during that time. He comes out of his wallet with two denarii. He gives it to the innkeeper. And he says, keep this man here until I come. These denarii are my surety that I will return. And if it requires any more payment when I return, uh, I will certainly pay for this man. And so Jesus then looks at the lawyer and he says, which one of these three men was the neighbor? And he said, well, the man who stopped to help him. And Jesus said, well, then go and do likewise. And, you know, to put one more point into this, it's significant that Jesus says he's a Samaritan. Now, why this? Well, the priest and the Levite are obviously Jews. The Samaritans uh, worship the same God as the Jews. They were in the northern kingdom. The Jews worship God in the southern kingdom, in Jerusalem. In the northern kingdom, the Samaritans worship God in, I believe it's called Mount Gerizim. And, but there's another significant point about the Samaritans, and guess what this was? The Samaritans were light-skinned, just like me. They were light-skinned. And why were they light-skinned? You know, in the black community, I don't know if the white community goes through this, ritual that we go through in the black community, but in the black community, we're fixated on color. 
you know, how dark, how light is a person, and we have language that we use to describe a person, you know, that you've never seen before. Well, he's, you know, real bright skin. He's, you know, dark skin, uh, you know, light brown skin, so forth. In uh, some of my mission work to refugees of war uh, from Liberia in Cote d'Ivoire, they described me as the bright man with the money. If you can imagine that, they said, when is the bright man with the money returning? Uh, but, you know, and one day I'm going to bring a guest on this show to talk about some of my mission work where I literally was the bright man with the money. But in the case of the Samaritan, and why it was such a big deal for Jesus to say this man was a Samaritan uh, in particular was that the, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And they hated them because their light skin was a bellwether. It was a, uh, it was a sure enough signal that these people were the product of intermarriage with the Assyrians when Assyria took over the northern kingdom. And, uh, and then you end up with the Babylonian exile. And so one day I'll talk about that. But uh, it's so ironic that these people hated each other, uh, but by the same token, they worshiped the same God. And so you had a color issue uh, that's intertwined into this. Uh, and, and it's ironic that the person that the Jews hated most in the parable that Jesus tells of the Good Samaritan is the man who actually stops uh, to help this injured individual. And so that's where we begin today. I have a special guest I want to introduce you to, the Reverend David Nunn Telford. How are you doing today? I am well. I'm well. I am excited to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I'm excited to have you. Uh, and let me just say this, Reverend Telford, Nunn Telford, when I met him, he was Reverend Telford, uh, but he got married. And as is the case, as is the case in many uh, people getting married today, he's added the name of his wife, mm -hmm. Nunn, mm -hmm. yeah. N-U-N-N, -N -N, right. Telford. And uh, Reverend Telford is, uh, I hope, can I say your age? Yeah, absolutely. He's 32. <laughs> and uh, I've made it a mission to try to acquaint myself with all the outstanding young ministers mm. uh, who've come through, uh, had some connection with the United Church of Christ on one level or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just delighted you're in the Chicago area now. Yeah. And uh, what's your take on the, uh, the lessons from the Good Shepherd? Excuse me, Good Samaritan. Yeah, it is a fascinating, fascinating story and parable. And one of the things that I really love about the parable is taking a step back and asking the question, why does Luke tell this story? Um, you know, you were mentioning that the Good Samaritan or a version of this parable shows up in different Gospels. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is that all of the Gospel writers have a perspective. They have an angle, right? I want the viewers uh, at home to know that anytime you're reading any of the Gospels, you need to take a moment and ask the question, who is the author talking to and why? And when I think about Luke, Luke is often talking to the downtrodden. Luke is talking to those who have been cast out and excluded themselves, right? In Matthew, uh, Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, it's the Sermon on the Plain, right? So it's not an elevated Jesus. Jesus is down with the people. And so for me, when I hear about this parable, and I learned so much from what you just kind of expounded on, I really think about why Luke would want uh, a outcast, downtrodden people, those who know what it's like to be excluded, to hear about someone going out of their way um, to, 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 to reach down, right? Someone who maybe is different from them, someone who they don't have any relation to, uh, someone's going to stop and care about them. Um, and for me, Maybe, right, one of the reasons why uh, Luke wants to tell that story um, is because he wants people to know um, that there is a God that cares about them. 
that as much as they may be ignored by the world, as much as they may have been excluded, as much as they may have been beat down by systems of injustice themselves, uh, there is a God that cares about them and will stop and see about them even when the rest of the world walks on by. So for me, uh, the why behind this parable is, um, is a phenomenal. Uh, but then the second piece that stands out to me is thinking about what, what the text bears witness to. Um, there is a New Testament scholar, uh, Dr. Shively Smith. And Dr. Shively Smith, um, I was taking a course with her one time and she always asked the question, uh, what does this text bear witness to? And one of the things that um, you illuminated that I just want to uh, double click on, if I will, is the fact that this Samaritan knows what it's like to be excluded. And I just wonder what it must have been like for the Samaritan to see this person beat up, left for dead, maybe having even seen others ignore them. And I just feel as if the Samaritan might have known what that felt like in one way or another and decided that regardless of the racial rules of the day, regardless of whatever the, the mores or the boundaries may have been, I know what it's like to be there. And I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to take out of my own resources and I'm going to reach down because I know what it's like to be there. And so when the question comes up, what does this text bear witness to? Maybe it's about what it's like to know what it's like to be in a situation and not care about what the optics may be, not care about what the boundaries may be, and to stop and pause long enough to recognize the humanity in someone else and say, I know what it's like, I'm gonna reach out to you, right? So um, Dr. Smith often asks like, you know, what is this text ask, you know, asking us to leave behind, right? What story do we leave behind for the other generations, right? And I wonder if we could leave behind a story of what it's like for us to recognize someone who's gone through something that we went through, right? Someone who's been in a situation that we were going through and everybody may ignore them, but like, no, I got you because I know what it's like to, to be there. Reverend uh, David Nunn Telford, I like that. Uh, I know what it's like. Matter of <laughs> fact, that sounds like a good sermon title. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Folks, uh, we're gonna take a, a break and uh, when we come back, we're going to hear a little bit more from Reverend David Nunn Telford and the story of the Good Samaritan. Stick around and we'll be right back. This is a new ministry which is just starting. Reverend Hood needs your help in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and his power throughout the world. If you would be so kind as to send a donation to Nicholas Hood III Ministries of any amount, Reverend Hood will send you a free complimentary copy of his book of original personal prayers and beautiful photographs entitled The Test, The Strength, The Endurance, and The Way Out. We appreciate your support and in this way you can partner with Reverend Hood in sharing the good news of Jesus throughout the world. Please make your check out to Nicholas Hood III Ministries and mail it to 4535 Chrysler Drive, Detroit, Michigan. 48201. Thank you for uh, sticking around for this segment. Uh, and again, for those who may be new to this, this is a new ministry and uh, it requires a lot. But I tell you, it's the most encouraging thing in the world. Uh, people ask me, uh, what kind of data analytics do you get uh, from this show? And I'm going to be honest, uh, I don't have hard data analytics, but data analytics, but what I do have is every week, every Saturday at uh, 2.30, the phone is ringing off the hook. And I'm receiving support from, uh, most recently, uh, from a fellow named Charles Johnson in, in, in New York. Uh, Deborah McIntosh, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, Kevin and Phyllis Tony, Los Angeles, California. Uh, Laura and Jackie Wyatt right here in Detroit and, and many others around the country. A man from Beaumont, Texas called for me to pray uh, for uh, 
hostages uh, who were, you know, in Syria, you know, Orthodox priests uh, who are hostages. And uh, what that tells me is that people all around the world are really connected to the Word Network. And uh, I want you to know I need your support. Uh, and if you can support this ministry at any level, I'll be happy to send you a complimentary copy of my first book. It's a book of prayers and photographs entitled The Test, The Strength, The Endurance, and The Way Out. Uh, but again, thank you for watching today and just the knowledge that you're watching makes me feel good. Uh, I'm joined today by Reverend David Nunn Telford. And uh, Reverend Telford, you were just talking about um, your professor. Uh, he didn't say where he went to divinity school, but I think it's noteworthy. Tell everybody where you went to divinity school. I went to Yale University's uh, School of Divinity. And I love it because that's where I went. <laughs> you know, uh, for some 40 years, almost 50 years before you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just great to see that the tradition continues. But uh, can you illuminate uh, a little bit more what you were saying about what your professor uh, had lifted up before your class that uh, Jesus was looking at that Samaritan as a person who could look at the injured person right and to say I know what it's like yeah I know what it's like absolutely but tell us a little more absolutely yeah so you know every text bears witness to something right yes. mm -hmm. um, texts are testimony right it is a story that is being transmitted to a community that wants uh, to tell a story about themselves, but also about God and the way that God is working in their lives. And so one of the things that this text bears witness to is someone who is at the margins of a society and knowing what it's like to be excluded, knowing what it's like to perhaps even incur some type of harm, and then coming across someone who is in that exact position, right? You know, uh, many scholars and preachers and, you know, even just people like you and me will have the question, you know, why didn't the other people stop, right? You know, and we have all these different theories about them being busy and there being laws and, um, you know, someone who was injured may be considered, um, according to some of the Deuteronomic law, like unclean as they go into worship and things like that. But there's a certain level of vulnerability that the Samaritan had to take on this windy, dangerous road, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the only way that they get there is they have to throw out all consideration and just say, what have I felt like when I've been in that position? How would I have wanted to be treated when I was at my lowest, when I was the most helpless, and maybe no one stopped for me? Or maybe someone did and I want to pass it on. I mean, so the text itself bears witness to someone who says, I'm going to be vulnerable enough to do this, um, to do this thing and to show up in the world um, in the way that I really would have wanted someone to show up um, for, for me. And I, you know, and, I, and I imagine Luke hearing this story, right? As Luke is going around and hearing the oral transmission of this being passed down from generation to generation, I just believe that Luke's ears perked up because Luke knows the community that um, they are writing for. And so Luke says, I know some people who need to hear this. I know some people who know who are living in the shadow of the Roman Empire, who know what it's like to be cast out, who know what it's like to have their entire livelihood heavily taxed. Some people who perhaps are told by an empire that they don't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And they need to hear a story that lets them know um, that they serve a God and um, they are living in a universe that will take time to see about them. Reverend, when you speak of the courage of vulnerability, hmm. what that speaks to in my mind is that being a good Samaritan is not all that is cracked up to be. Hmm. I live in Detroit, hmm. Michigan. I saw a man get shot hmm. one night. Believe it or not, I mean, that's the most extraordinary thing. Yeah. On my way home, at the time, this is 
20 some years ago. I was on a member of the Detroit City Council. Wow. I'm riding in a city vehicle on the continuation of my street, McClellan Street. Mm -hmm. I live on Lodge and these two guys are fighting and I slow down and next thing I know, and it's near dark, mm -hmm. I see a man hold his hand out and then I see a flash of light. Yeah. And I'm saying to myself, my God, that man just shot another man. Hmm. And I watched the guy, you know, uh, he stagger away up the street toward me, toward my car. Yeah. And all I'm thinking about is I'm in a city vehicle hmm. with a city telephone. <laughs> you know, I called 911 and I told him, I said, I just saw a man get shot. And then the man finally falls out. For those of you in Detroit who know the area, Kerchival Street. Hmm. He falls out on Kerchival. I swing around behind him so nobody can run over him. Hmm. But uh, eventually the police come. But before the police come, a lady who happens to, not that it matters, but she's white, she gets out of her car with a pillow from her trunk, puts it under, she must have been a nurse, hmm. but she puts his head on the pillow and starts CPR on a man. Uh, in my case, uh, I'm terrified yeah. because the yeah. shooter saw me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as it turned out, I think the man lived because the police never called me back. I talked to the police. I gave him my name, my, you know, uh, my story, what I had seen. But the point, only point that I'm making is being a good Samaritan is not all that is cracked up to be. Mm -hmm. uh, because, as you said, it takes courage. Right. And the courage is not just across the street, but what would the, what would have the what would have happened had the robbers come back at him? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for him to help that man, he's got to bend down, and he becomes even more vulnerable. Uh, Reverend Telford, Reverend Nun Telford, we are about out of time. Okay. But uh, I'm so glad for those of you who are watching. Reverend Nun Telford is going to be with me for the next four weeks, and uh, I think it's refreshing. Uh, hearing your perspective. And uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, I've been talking with the Reverend David Nunn Telford, 32-year-old, relatively recent graduate of the Yale Divinity School. And I'm just so proud of you and, and how you're doing. Uh, we've got to wrap this up now, but thanks so much for watching. And again, uh, I'll be on this channel, 2.30 p.m next week. If you have a prayer issue, call the 1-800 line uh, that is on the screen right now. Uh, if you think you can support this ministry, I hope that you will do so at whatever level. And uh, as I shared earlier, I'll be happy to send you a complimentary copy of my first book, The Test, The Strength, The Endurance, The Way Out. God bless, God keep you, and remember, I am praying for you.